marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It always has been, and it always will be, a very sensitive subject. It is a time when emotions run high. It is a time when we lose focus, as it were, of the things that we actually should be taking more focus on. And to be quite honest with you, most of the time, because the emotions are running so high, we are inclined to have our vision blurred, as it were. Now, I wanted to start this evening by taking a look at what the Lord Jesus Christ said. What he said because of a question that was posed to him. Is it lawful for us to divorce our wife for any cause? And you'll see my reason for going through this particular chapter at the beginning. Now, you would have noticed that there are three colors, and then there are three colors in there, and that's the, the interlinear literal translation. And there are three words, or three combination words, that I've highlighted. Now, the reason why I've done this is because the Lord Jesus Christ, unlike us, was superb at using just the right word at the right time. Also, he spoke when he spoke to people in a native tongue. We don't have that privilege. So when the Pharisees come to him and they say to him, is it lawful for us to divorce our wife for any cause? He goes into a very subtle discussion with them. And he says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Therefore, or wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now you will notice that the word no more is one word. It's the word uketi. And the Lord Jesus Christ uses three compound words in his reply to them. And I have no doubt in my mind that the Pharisees at the time knew exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying to them and why he chose those words. Because the thrust of his, of his uh, argument to them was that they are no longer two people, that they have been joined together, and that word joined together is the word unite together. And it's the Greek word, suzoidzinami. That's what it means to be fused as in a metal. It means taking metal and fusing together with great heat. And if, if you had to try and take them apart, there would be irreparable damage. Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying when he used that word. And then he uses the last word, which is the word chorezio which is also a compound word, which means let not separate. You know, it's interesting. It's the moment he posed that to the Pharisees, pride took over immediately. Instead of them coming back, they gave what is commonly called a straw man. They said, let's move the argument away. He's got us with this one, so let's just move it away. And they say, why then did Moses command us to give our wife a bull of divorce? Moses did no such thing. That was a lie by the Pharisees. And he corrects them in a very subtle way. He says, says this, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But... Remember what I told you a few minutes ago, he says? From the beginning it was not so. Now I've just given you the strongest version of what the word hardness of heart means. It means an unfeelingness or hard-heartedness. A resolute, unfeeling adherence 
to one's own ideas or desires. In other words, at all costs, we will achieve what we want to achieve. That's what it means. And you would notice something else, is that in the numbers in Scripture by Bullinger, he uses three combined words, three combination words, and it means solid, real, substantial, complete, and entire, or divine perfection. So Jesus was saying to them, this isn't a personal request. This is a divine instruction. You do not have the right, nor do you have the ability to separate what God has joined through a covenant. So what he was saying to them was this. He was saying that divorce, simply put, if we divorce our spouse, our wife, or our husband, we have openly declared that we are not willing to forgive. We are not willing to go into any more reconciliation process. We are not willing to even slightly contemplate the possibility of reconciliation with the wife or the husband of our covenant. Divorce. Jesus says to them in a subtle way, you're not prepared to forgive, but you expect us to. You expect me and my father to forgive you. But more importantly, is if we are sympathetic towards divorce and remarriage. That is what Jesus is saying. We are hard at heart. It's not the other way around. Jesus isn't saying that, look, if you aren't sympathetic towards marriage and divorce, then you're hard at heart. He's saying, hold on. Because of the hardness of a heart, you put your wife away. There's a big difference. So I thought I'd approach that just to make sure that we are 100% clear in our mind. To support what we believe to be true, and that's the big problem. What we should be doing is putting scripture forward to support what God believes to be true. In fact, Paul the apostle picks this up beautifully in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. And he says this, the Holy Spirit says, Do not harden your hearts as in the day of propagation, as it says in the authorized version, because of in the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. The carcasses fell, and they never entered the promised land with Joshua. And he says, I was provoked. Because they always went astray, and they did not know my ways, and therefore I swore that they will never enter my rest. Those are my words. Those are the Apostle Paul's words. So what I've done, to start this off with the different passages, is to take an overview of what the gospel is all about when it refers to this subject. And I've put this in a flow chart because I thought it is that much easier to take a snapshot view. So let me just show you. You've got Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27 when it refers to if you look upon a woman to lust, you have committed adultery with her in your heart already. And then in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32, it turns around and it says that if you divorce your wife, and I'm paraphrasing you, but you'll see exactly this, exactly what it says. If you divorce your wife, even if you stay celibate, you cause your wife to commit adultery. So now marriage and divorce and remarriage had actually taken place on the side of the husband. But the innocent party, the wife who was at the receiving end of the husband's divorce, he has caused his wife, as it says in the next verse, taken from the complete Jewish Bible and the Targum and the Tanakh and the Talmud, all say the same thing. 
that if it was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a get. Now that word get is just the Hebrew terminology for given a bull of divorce. And it says, but I say, this is the Lord Jesus Christ now, I say to you that if anyone divorces his wife, except on the ground of fornication, so you can almost put that in parentheses and just say that that's not the thrust of the argument, that's just an exception, he makes her an adulteress. He makes her an adulteress. And yet, no act has taken place here. There's been no marriage. She's the innocent party. And even worse, if anyone, that's no exceptions, divorced, married, single, marries that divorcee, they commit adultery. And you're going to see that there are quite a few variations in these four, in these four Gospels. So when we come back here and we look at it, we can see Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32 where it says, If you divorce your wife, you cause her to become an adulteress. And if, and if anybody marries her, they also fall into the same category. Then, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, it adds what I would call an extra point of entry or another intersection. And it says that if a man divorces his wife and he marries someone else, he commits adultery. And if someone marries the innocent party, the wife, who has now been divorced by her husband, they commit adultery. And then, if we go to Mark chapter 10, we are told that if you divorce your wife, you cause, well, you cause an act of adultery against her. And it then it brings in another angle. It says that, well, Seeing as though there's no record in Matthew because Matthew was written specifically for a Jewish audience. Well, if the wife divorces her husband, then she commits adultery. And in Luke chapter 16 verse 18 says, If you divorce your wife and remarry, you commit adultery. And then, of course, there's the acceptive clause. And there's... But I would always refer to not the acceptive clause, I call it the emotional clause, because generally it's not an acceptive clause until such time as it normally affects someone in the immediate family, and then it becomes an acceptive clause. But it was never experienced like that, and the Lord Jesus Christ never ever made an exception for remarriage. But let's push on, because the Lord Jesus Christ then turns around and says, and I'm going to raise the bar, just like I told you that if... You say that you hate your brother, you are a murderer. Turns around and he says, if you conceal your sin, and it's picked up in Proverbs, if you try to conceal your sin and try and think that while you're walking around, you look all squeaky clean, and you haven't actually done anything wrong physically for everybody else to see, but within your mind, you're actually looking upon a woman, and you're looking upon this woman as the lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So you can see, there's another factor at the bottom, and that's the word anyone. Christ is making no exceptions here. He's saying that it doesn't matter. This is applicable to everybody. All roads lead to adultery. In every single one of those Gospels, every single one, there is no exception. There is possibly a different avenue or possibly a, a part that's left out. All it's given us is variation. So in you, there's no exception. And you'll see this. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to the, what I call the Decai factor. Decai is two Greek words. 
And one is normally translated with transliteration, it's translated but or even. And the other one is a copulative word and a commutative word. And it's one of those words that like joining together, it forges and it brings emphasis to a sentence or a clause or a statement. And that's, I always try and put the little pictures there just to show you where I've taken that information from. Now, the intermediate Greek lexicon says this. It's a conjunction. It's used in two principal senses, either copulative to join words and sentences, or it's making a single word, clause, or phrase emphatic. So you're probably thinking to yourself, that's fantastic. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I want to put up Matthew 19, just so that you can see where those words are used. The one in blue is the word death. And you can see it's and, and, and in that one here it's but. The ones in green is the word kai. And it also means and. And with a different. And I'll show you. And you see the red is the colon. And everybody knows what the colon is. It's the end of the statement. And then it gives the speaker an opportunity to build on what they've already said. So what I want to do is I want to actually invite you what I call the Decai breakfast. And what I mean by that is this. You can have egg or you can have bacon. Right? Which means that if you had them, you could have them served on a plate as a meal of egg, or you could have served on a plate as a meal of bacon. But when you add the chi factor in, then what you do is you get egg and bacon. And what that tells you is this, is that you are getting a meal served on a plate as a meal combined. Now I've given it to you as an example, because the Lord Jesus Christ says, but I say that whosoever divorces and marries committeth adultery. The actual adultery is a consequence. It's not an act, it's a consequence. I'll give you another example. You can have a contractual agreement, and on that contractual agreement, you could put, I will dedicate my entire life to whipping. You've got a piece of paper with some words written on it. Is it enforcing? No. But take the agreement, you put a signature on it, and it becomes a valid document. So an agreement and a signature, Kai, is a valid agreement. It makes it emphatic. So all of those with the ticks use that word. So let's just take a look at Matthew chapter 19 in a little bit more detail. And here what I want to do is I want to use the same interlinear literal translation. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, Moreover, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, and shall marry another committed adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Well, once again, Jesus uses compound words. And he uses four compound words in that particular chapter. He uses the word apaleo, which means to put away. He uses the word gameo, which means shall marry. And in it, twice he uses the word moichal, 
It's very interesting to know that Moichal in the Greek, because there are a few cognate words that go along with it. And there are many variations, but that word occurs just four times in the entire Bible. And they're all in Matthew and Mark. No one else. We've been told something here. And I'll tell you what it is. If you look at the interlinear, do you see that little arrow? That little arrow is pointing adultery back that way. That's because in the original Greek, the word adultery does not appear. The word adultery is part of the compound word, which is the word committeth. So you can see up there, one word, moichal, and it's got two words combined in it, which is committeth adultery. But the predominant word, the emphatic word, is the word committed. So if you had to read it in the original Greek, you would see that if you marry another man, you committed. And the transliterators put it down and said, okay, let's make it simpler for the people that are not so afraid of the Greek. But what's interesting is this, is that that word is a verb. And a verb is something that normally and always expresses activity. But it's not just a verb, it's a third person singular verb. Which means it's telling you this, the condition in which things are happening or being done. Committeth adultery. It's telling you it's a third person. What did God say in the beginning? He created man and woman, that there are no more twain that should be one. What God has therefore joined together, let not man even contemplate separating. But now it's telling you there's a third person involved. And it's telling you there's a third person involved, you've committed to adultery. That's what it means. It's not a case of a one off shot. Well, I've just done a bad thing. I'm very sorry, and it won't happen again. That's not what it's saying here in the Greek. Those are the places. That that word exists, committed. It, 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 it's in Mark, Matthew 5, verse 32, Matthew 19, verse 9, Mark 10, 11, Mark 10, 12. That's where it sits. But more interesting is the fact that it actually means to practice adultery. You know what the word practice means? It means to be actively involved in it. Can you remember when, the, when Yahweh? Every single time and we spoke to the nation and he said to them that when they were practicing adultery, he says, put away your foreign gods from among you and worship me. So in actual fact, so long as you're practicing adultery, you're out of fellowship with God. It's that simple. And that is what the word means. The word committed. Let me give it to you in a simple way. We're going to dodge your husband who decides that he's going to divorce his wife and it's going to, after about the 2,000th itch, he's going to get a young wife. And that's adultery. According to Matthew 19. So then what happens is this. She's the innocent party. Why then should I stay single? Why should I stay single? What have I done? Surely I can get an upgrade. So I'll get an upgrade. Young guy. But that's adultery. Why? Is God that unjust? There's nothing in here about looking upon a woman to lust. She's the innocent party, but she's been labeled as an adulteress? Have we ever considered this? Or have we just read through those and automatically assumed that they all mean the same thing, you know, all in the Gospels? It doesn't, actually. Because God has given us examples. And it tells you from Mark's perspective, because remember, only the Jews' males were allowed to divorce their partner. The female was not allowed to. So when Mark's gospel was given to the Gentiles, exceptions were made so that they could make allowances for the wife to divorce. But it says, you divorce your husband, and marry another, you can make adultery. Same word, moichal, verb, third person singular. You've committed to adultery. 
So why is it though? Why is it that the person that's actually innocent can be branded and styled as an adulterer? Why? Because marriage and divorce is adultery. And it involves a sense. Anybody know what a sense is? It's part, if you give a sentence and you style a particular phrase in a sentence, you, you explain him a situation that is occurring. It's not an act. It's not something that you say that I've done. So let's just take a look here. Just to see what kind of information we've been given. You divorce your wife and stay celibate, she becomes an adulteress. Innocent as she is, she becomes the adulteress. And you? You're the one that's responsible for it. That's what it says. And if anybody marries that woman, who's what's been put away, who was innocent in the first place, and the guy that's married her, he's also innocent, but he becomes an adulterer. Doesn't sound like a very forgiving and loving God, does it? So can you spot the loophole in all of this? Considering that the next one is, if you marry divorce and remarry, you commit to adultery. And if your wife marries, she commits adultery. And if some innocent party marries her, he commits adultery. And Mark 10 says, if you divorce your wife, you commit adultery against her. If she divorces her husband, she becomes an adulteress. And if anybody marries other of them, they become adulterers. And then Luke says, if you divorce your wife and remarry, you become an adulterer. And if anybody else that's innocent, doesn't matter from where they come, marry or, or anything, because it says, whosoever, you commit adultery. But can you spot the loophole? And if you can't, don't feel bad because there isn't one. Take a look at this. Just take a look how emphatically it's been put towards us. Just take a look of how the argument is being brought. doesn't matter where you... It's like going on an orbital in the UK or going to the Champs-Élysées in France where you've got the centre point, the traffic circle in the middle and all the roads are leading into it. In the centre is adultery and all those roads, no matter how many twists and turns there are, all end up in exactly the same place and that's adultery. So why is that woman called an adulterer or an adulteress? It's a bit, it actually is a difference between the two. One practices it. You can commit adultery, a single act, and that's it. But once you become an adulteress, you are actually practicing it. And I'll show you. Because her husband was still alive. Irrespective of whether she was guilty or not, or whether she orchestrated the entire thing, or whether she was totally innocent in the entire process, she was part and parcel of the covenant relationship that took place between her and her husband for Yahweh. And until such time as her husband has passed away, she's bound by that. So irrespective of whether she initiated it or not, she has to say celibate until the husband dies. Want to see a, a connecting word? It's the, actually the word called. And in the Greek it is the word hamatizo. It means to be named. To go into a state of being named. And she's been called an adulteress. So she's been branded with it. And it actually even goes further. It says she's been styled an adulteress. Do you know how you style something? For any of those who've got a word processor, you'll know that. If you take a particular word and you change all the colours and all the rest of it, and you finish it, it says to you, do you want to change the style? Click yes. Guess what? It's not the same as it was before. It's different. And that's exactly what it means. It means a distinctive appearance typically determined by the principles according to which something is designed. If her husband is still alive and she marries the man of another man, she shall be called, dulled, 
an adulteress. Take a look at what Acts chapter 11. The only two times in the entire Bible that word occurs. The disciples were called, styled Christians first in Antioch. So tell me, how were they not called uh, Christians? Well, it's easy. Don't follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see the impact? And just to take a look, there's the word adulterous, same word, except that it's a slight variation in the Greek. In the original Greek for the word adult, uh, committed adultery is the word moichal, and this particular one is the word moichalit, which is a slight variation, it's one of the cognate words of that. And I'll put down the Lindell and Scott, that's where it comes from. So what about new vows? What about it? Surely, it, none of this means anything because really, all I have to do is just say, well, I made a mistake. I'll get married. It's a new vow. Bob's your uncle. God will hold you to that vow. Well, first of all, we have to understand that an oath is something that you say and is witnessed by God. A vow is something that you promise to God, and a covenant is a combination of vows and oaths. So here's the thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. When you vow a vow unto God, do not defer, defer not to pay it. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Let's take a look at the contemporary English version. God doesn't like fools. So don't be slow to keep your promises to God. It's better not to make a promise at all than to make one and not keep it. Tell me, logically you're reading that. Don't go any further. What vows are talking about? First, second, fifth, one hundredth, one thousand? It's talking about first vow. And it goes on to say, don't let your mouth get you into trouble. That's quite simple. Don't turn and make another vow. Let's get a conflict with the first one. And don't say to the leader, I didn't mean what I said. God can destroy everything you have worked for. So, you, so don't say something that makes God angry. Well, I'd like you to keep that in your mind just for a moment. What about the Gibeon us? came there, they came under a false illusion to Joshua. <coughs> he was hoodwinked. He listened to them. They got a big story about their pictures all being so soiled and outdated because long distance they traveled. And you know what? How many vows were made with the giving out? What? And that was, even though it was wrong, that is the one that God held them to. Irrespective, because they did not consult him. So what would happen if there was a second vow in relation to the Gibeonites? Could there be a conflicting vow? I mean, surely, think about this logically. If the second vow counts, all, all Joshua had to do was, listen guys, you were totally off the mark with this. You lied straight laced to us. I know we're supposed to keep this, but I'll tell you now, we're making another vow right now. If we're not going to honor that one, and we're going to do everything in our power to make life as difficult for you, and that's our second vow, and that's the one God's going to honor, forget about the first one. It didn't work like that. Because what actually happened was, Joshua says to them, you are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and he was a wood and drawers of water. And in actual fact, just to go just a little bit further, in Joshua chapter 10, if ever there was a time for where to be a loophole in it, it was this. Is that they could have turned around and said, well, we'll just leave it to devices. We never said that we would not fight the battles. We just said, we won't kill them. So let them kill them. They are dead. End of vow. No problem. But they didn't. They went and fought the battle for them. And what else? And God sends a famine in the days of David for three years. Why? Because Saul, in his zeal for Israel, he goes and he destroys the whole of the Gibeonites. 
And if it wasn't for the fact that, that the, uh, David went to them and said, well, what is the problem? What is going on? He said, well, if you want atonement made for your sin, take the progeny of, of Saul and hang him up to die. So tell me, which vow was on it? That was the second vow. And David had to approve the crucifixion of all sons of seven, I think, of Saul's progeny. Why? Because he chose to break the first vow. So given the fact that this is not even in marriage, you can quite clearly see that God holds us responsible for what we do. Now, I want to give you an example, just a little colored example. We can make different colored vows. We can make five, six, seven vows to God in earnest and faithful. And you know what? God will hold us to those. Because Ecclesiastes chapter 5 tells us, keep your promises to God. So what does it say about making five vows that are exactly the same, all of them conflicting each other? Vow one being the first one, vow two conflicting vow, uh, vow one, vow three conflicting vow two, and so forth. Do you think God's going to automatically say, ah, oh, sorry, that was a mistake, right, we're on to that one. All right, sorry, that one was a mistake, we're on to that one, but forget about those two. Really? Is that what Ecclesiastes chapter 5 said? Mm -hmm. What did Ecclesiastes chapter 5 say? Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, I will respect God, says, the first vow, but I'll hold you responsible for the other ones. Why? Because don't let your mouth get you into trouble. That makes sense to me. There are no loopholes in God's code. Nothing. Only maybe a few hackers that try and get in, but God won't be, God won't be mocked. What would really be helpful if there was, I suppose, an example of more than one vow made in marriage. That would make it pretty conclusive. Well, so happens there is. Michael and David and Faltel. David is promised Michael as a wife. And Saul says, Go and slay 100 Philistines. Remember the four skins. David goes out and kills 200, brings them back, and he gets Michael for a while. But then things don't go that good with David and Saul. So what does he do? David's on the run. Michael is without a husband at the time. And Saul, who's notorious for making vows, breaking them, in inverted commas, and making a new one. He gives them to Falcon. But let's just take a look at this. Both were vows. Which vow was the one that was on? Any guesses? Well, I'll tell you. Goodbye, Felty. Because it was the first vow that was honored. And what actually happens is. Years later, David sends and he says, send me my wife. And her husband, that is Michael's, which is felty, is running down crying and sobbing. Almost like a sad story but with this woman all these years. Why? God says, you make the bed. You sleep in it. Just because you made a vow and I'm holding to you, doesn't mean to say I approve of it. You know what? This is exactly what it's saying here. They will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and they did not choose the fear of Yahweh, they would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the full of their own devices. That's what it's saying. That's because you make a decision. So it's just because 
You make a vow, and it's the wrong vow. God is going to say, oh, sorry. What does, he, what does Ecclesiastes say? Sorry, I didn't mean what I said. Tough luck. So I gave them up to their own hearts' lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Wherefore also God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. See, it doesn't mean to say that if we make something and we do something which we believe to be right, just remember God said, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We have to realize what oaths and vows are there for in the first place. Covenant is something that you swear. Look what God says. I swear unto thee and enter into a covenant with thee, says Yahweh Elohim, and thou becamest mine. And yes, our God, the Creator, that made that in the beginning. And if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant. Let's hold that thought in your head. Break. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of the enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am Yahweh their God. Interesting. Reconciliation has always been you want to know something? The word break is the word frustrate or violate. You can frustrate a vow. You can frustrate a covenant. You cannot terminate a covenant with God. It's there. Let me give you an example. The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. So tell me. If I kill... And I ask for forgiveness of that. Does that mean that that law of God no longer exists? Or have I violated it? And the same applies to adultery. And the same applies to theft. If I turn around and say, well, I made a mistake. Or I've been forgiven. What happens the next time you commit adultery? Is it not adultery? Or is it adultery? Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said to the woman in John chapter 8? He says that you were caught in adultery. One night, I told you about the cognate variations of the word moichal. This is the word moichos. It's an act. In actual fact, what it does is it actually tells you it tells you that this woman was taken in adultery, not committed adultery. It's not the word, same word, moichal, it's the word moichos. And it was a very act. What did Jesus say? Well, he'd been caught. But what I want you to do is, this is not pornia, which is the word fornication, from whence we get our word pornography. This is adultery. So either she was married, playing around, or there was a husband somewhere else, and she was just having a one-night stand. Either way, it's classified as adultery. But Jesus is saying to her this. He's saying at the moment now, it's boy cost. It's a singular act. But if you don't go back to your husband and don't sin anymore, it's going to become boy car. You're going to commit to sin. Then you've got a problem. Who shall abide in your tabernacle, Yahweh? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? But he that honoreth and feareth Yahweh and sweareth to his own hurt and changes not. I find that a fascinating song. You want to know why? You put it on the Jewish Bible and it says this. Who hold to an oath no matter the cost. Now, that is a contradiction in terms of if you can have more than one vow. Because how do you hold to a vow to an oath? No matter the cost. You just break it, one and open another one. Second, third, fourth, fifth, thousands, ten thousand. Doesn't make any difference. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. 
Don't be slow to hold the oath that you have promised. What God has joined together, man does not have any right whatsoever to separate. And that's why I've put that up there again. Because we come back a full circle back to here. If the woman, if she was totally innocent and her husband divorced her, he has caused her to be an adulteress through no fault of her own, except the fact that she was party. She was party to the covenant relationship, a vow between her, her husband, with God as the witness. And God says, so long as your husband's alive, you're potentially an adulteress because the moment you marry, that's what you're going to be. What about repentance? I find that picture fascinating. Sin keeps and separates us from God. You can see the void there. Nice big void. So as long as someone is in your midst that's actually practicing sin, and it may seem hard, tells us we cannot fellowship sin. We just cannot do that. God's not prepared to do it. We don't have the right to do that. But it says there that he that covereth his sins. Now that's exactly what Jesus was saying. He's saying, well look, you go out there, you Pharisees, you profess to be the best things since sliced bread. You walk out and say, look at us. You've got all your phylacteries at the bottom of your skirts and you're making yourself look and you like to be in the high places and be called Rabbi, Rabbi. You're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And you turn around and say, and you look so squeaky clean. But I'm telling you that I can look into the heart and I can tell you that if you've looked upon a woman to lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. And that's exactly what it's saying there. If you cover your sins, you will not prosper. Because repentance means to confess and forsake. Now I just want to put this up in some literal, in some new modern versions. It's this. If you've really turned from your sins to God, produce fruit that will prove it. Look at this one down here. Do something to show that you have really given up your sins. Not just case of saying, I'm sorry. What happened again? Now, where were we? It doesn't work like that. Look at this one. From Acts 26 verse 20. That they should turn from these sins to God and then do deeds consistent with that repentance. Stop sinning and turn to God. Then prove what you have done by the way you live. I mean, I couldn't get easier if you tried. What about the one in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where it talks about a man living with his stepmother? What did they do? That word living is just a random thing. That the word have is the actual word that means to have a personal or familial relationship with someone. A man living, Jewish Bible says, with his stepmother. What does Paul say? Put that evil from amongst you. That wicked person. Jewish, complete Jewish Bible says, just expel the evil doer from amongst yourselves. An interesting thing was, we know they're taken back. Was he still living with his stepmother? See, that's what true repentance is. It means to forsake. When you go and you are baptized, it talks about you going into the waters of baptism. And it says, well, if we have gone into if, and been baptized into his death, so shall we be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that we should walk in newness of life. You're looking that way, you go into baptism, and you come out, whatever you had before that is of no interest to you anymore because that's where you're looking. That's what repentance is. But it is much worse to dishonor God's Son and to disgrace the blood of promise that made us holy. If we practice sin, practice sin. We are not born of God. Is that simple? No, it's interesting. I'll put this up here because it's Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 16 and the, ticket, the net Bible brings this beautifully. It says this, 
is to deliver you from the adulteress, from the sexually loose woman who speaks flattering words, who leaves the husband from her younger days and forgets her marriage. What? Marriage covenant before God, for her house sinks down to death. Couldn't get clearer than that. You know, when you make a covenant, you cut a covenant. Genesis chapter 15 tells us the covenant that was made with Abram. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 12 tells us that because Yahweh was hearing the cries of those poor destitute women who were put away by their husband, the wife of their youth, it tells you, he says to the people that do that, I will cut off the same way. In other words, what they were saying is, that's what it says there. Yahweh is saying as the violator will become the victim. The person that's actually created that issue, the person that's actually gone and divorced him or divorced him wife, they're not going to be the violator anymore, the kingpin, the one in total control, the supreme, the big kahuna. They are the one which now have become the victim. That's what God says. You're no longer the, the victor. You're the victim. But whosoever committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth. Very interesting chap verse. The word destroyeth means to be ruined or to be cut off. That's exactly what Malachi chapter 2 told us. Exactly what Malachi chapter 2 told us. So, in reality, we can become an accessory, as it were. Quite easily. An accessory or an accomplice to that, because we keep on turning around, God keeps saying, these are my rules. We say, no, 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 you didn't mean that. This is what it means. Isn't that what the Pharisees said to him? That's exactly what the Pharisees said to him. Look what Paul says. Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. Idolaters. Remember what the word said? And he said, practice idolatry. That's what adultery is. That's what the word adulteress means. That's what the word clematizo means. That's what the word moichao means. That's what the word zuzuetso means. And all those decreed words, those compound words, all point to the same thing. You're either an adulterer, or you practice idolatry, in which case you are out of fellowship with God. And that's why it says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves, with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor regardless, nor extortioners, will what? Shall inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty stern words. And First Corinthians, unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. That's exactly what Leviticus was saying, with God saying that they became his when he swore to them. And I think it's such a lovely picture. Because that's what we should be aspiring to. That is what the scripture is saying. That if we, go in, if we go into a marriage relationship with our wife, or our wife goes into a marriage relationship with her husband, this is not something to be taken lightly. This is something where you, in fact, are attempting to cut and sever, frustrate a vow witnessed by the Creator of heaven and earth. What is to say? Likewise, you husbands. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessels, as being what? Is together of the grace of life, so that your prayers be not hindered. What that means? You don't comply with that. God's not even going to listen to you. That's what it's talking about. He turns around and he walks away from you. And you can stand on your head, but it's not going to make any difference. So just in summary, 
If we are sympathetic to divorce, we are hard at heart. It's not the other way around. It's not like, well, no. Where's your heart? Can't you see the people are struggling? You're so hard at heart because you want it. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says that for the hardest of your heart, you put away your wife. Big difference. There are no loopholes getting around adultery. It's emphatic. I never made the rules. God did. Adultery described by Jesus is a state, not an act. I think I've proved that pretty categorically. The first vow is respected by God, not the second, third, fourth, fifth, one hundredth, or the two millionth. The first one. You cannot terminate a vow. You can't just walk away from it and say, like a PGS, yes, and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. What a mistake. Let's just move on. All right, next one. Doesn't happen like that. That's exactly the lesson with the Gibeonites. Because that wasn't the case. The progeny of Saul would still be alive. And they would. And last of all, repentance means to confess and forsake.